All right, in this video, what I am going to do is introduce a second calculator function. And when I say second calculator function, I mean in addition to the normal CDF calculator function. I just finished making a video on the normal CDF ca calculator function. Um, you, maybe you just watched it, it's all this up here. At any rate, the big takeaway from the normal CDF calculator function is that it allows you to find the area underneath the curve. And we've talked a lot about what the area underneath the curve represents. It's one of two different things. The probability that one observation falls in a given range or the percentage of all observations that fall in a given range and often you need to find this area and anytime you're trying to find the area use the normal cdf function you're like why are you talking so much about that because the inverse norm calculator function is similar but it doesn't find the area underneath the curve the best way i can state it is you use it when you're already told the area underneath the curve so not when you're trying to find the area underneath the curve but when you're already told the area underneath the curve. And in this video, it won't be hard because these videos, this video, all four examples, or however many there are, three, I think, use the inverse norm calculator function. You're like, of course you use them. That's what you're doing in this section. But what you'll see is, odds are, if you're in my class for sure, but I'm guessing any intro to statistics class, when your midterm rolls around, you're gonna have a bunch of word problems. And it's not gonna tell you use normal CDF or use inverse norm. You're gonna have to be able to tell just by reading the problem which one it is. So in this video, I wanna talk about what the inverse norm function is and get you comfortable with it. And then in the next one, I'm gonna give you a bunch of word problems and talk about how you can tell whether it's inverse norm or normal CDF. All right, without further ado, let's get going. The same example we've seen a bunch of times. Suppose the volume of a dog's loudest bark is approximately normally distributed. That tells me to draw this symmetric bell-shaped curve. And then what I've been doing is putting in the mean and counting up and down by the standard deviation. I'm gonna do something a little bit different in this example and I'll explain why. First off, my mean is 80 decibels, mu equals 80. So I am gonna put that in the picture. But my standard deviation, my spread, sigma, which is 10 decibels, I'm not gonna count up and down by tens here. And the reason why is because I wanna be able to draw the picture and I won't be able to draw the picture at this point. I'll show you why, maybe just follow along. When you're in inverse norm questions, typically you don't count up and down by the standard deviations. And you're like, well, if you don't count up and down by the standard deviations, how's the reader gonna know what the standard deviation is? If you don't put a 90 here and a 100 here and a 110 here. Well, I labeled it in the problem up here, so I think we'll be good. But later on, I'm gonna show you a more um, complete way of giving that information to the reader. But anyway, back to the task at hand. How loud must a dog be able to bark in order for it to bark louder than 90% of dogs. Maybe you recognize that this 90% of dogs is kind of indicating the area underneath the curve. They're telling me the area underneath the curve is 90%. There's some volume of dog bark. I don't know what it is at this point, which is very different from the normal CDF questions where you're told the volume of dog bark and you're figuring out the area. In this one, I'm not told the volume of dog bark. I know that's a weird thing to say. I'm just saying there is some level, and I want to know how, what that level is in order for it to be louder than 90% of dogs. There's some amount over here. I don't know exactly where it is. I'm going to put it right here in my, quest, in my picture. I don't know what this number is. There's some number that goes right here. I don't know, a big circle or something, a question mark. Maybe neither. There's some number that goes right here, and that number is special in the sense that it's the number chosen perfectly to make this area 90%. I'm not figuring out that area. I'm told that area. How do I know that this area is 90%? Because this question asks how loud must a dog be able to bark in order for it to bark louder than 90% of dogs. Remember, one interpretation of the area underneath the curve is it tells me the percentage of all dogs that can bark that level. So 90% of all dogs can bark less loud than this amount. Put differently, this amount is louder than the volume at which 90% of dogs bark. Man, I'm making that sound harder than it is. Anyway, fortunately for you, the inverse norm function on your calculator is perfectly suited for exactly this task. The inverse norm function on your calculator, uh, first I guess we should find it. It's in that same menu that normal CDF was in, the distribution menu. You can remember that because it deals with the normal distribution. All these videos are talking about the normal distribution. To get into the distribution menu, you hit second and then variables. I see a lot of functions in here. The only two we use are the second one, normal CDF, the previous video, 
and inverse norm, the third one in this video. When you hit enter on inverse norm, depending on your calculator, it'll actually, I guess there's a few different options you can see here. I think most calculators will look like mine looks here, but I'm going to tell you what to do even if yours doesn't. Um, it asks for three arguments, not four, just three. When it says area here, it means the area to the left of the point you're looking for. So the point that I'm looking for is right here. The area to the left of that point is this 90%. 90%, the way I put 90% into a calculator, is 0 0.9. You have to always enter them as decimals. 0 0.90 if you want. Area to the left of this point is 90%. The center is 80. And the spread is 10. If you don't have this version of the software, um, your calculator might just put inverse norm down, in which case you have to know it wants the area to the left, comma, the center, comma, and the spread. If you have a really fancy calculator, fancier than mine, it will ask you for the area, and then it'll say something like, is this the area below the point, or to the left of the point, or to the right of the point, or middle, or something like that? And you have to indicate that in this example, it's the area below. At any rate, inverse norm 0.9, 80, 10. I'm going to write that down here to kind of show my work in case I make some little mistake and I still want to get partial credit from my teacher. Hit enter, spits out a number. This does not mean 92% of dogs or something like that. This is a volume, this is the amount of decibels. It's saying that if a dog can bark 92.82 decibels, that's pretty loud. How loud is it? It's louder than 90% of the dogs out there can bark. 10% bark louder than this amount. But most dogs, 90%, bark less loud than this amount. This right here would be my answer to the question. And I got that using the inverse norm function on my calculator. Let me do some more examples. Hopefully make this make a little bit more sense. Oh, we're done with that dog one, good. Can stop saying decibels versus decimals. Um, the weight of an offensive tackle, so I'm not too creative. I've used this example in the past also in these videos. But I guess if it ain't broke, use it again. Um, so I'm told the weight of an offensive tackle is approximately normal, that's why I tried to draw this symmetric bell-shaped curve. The mean is 270 and the standard deviation is 30. We've been drawing the picture, you put the mean in the middle, you might be tempted to count up and down by 30s. I never talked about why we didn't do that. I forgot. Sorry. Let me go back. I didn't count up by 10s at the very start because I wanted to indicate this point on my picture before I knew what this number was. So think about it. If I had counted up 90, 100, 110, I wouldn't know where to put this point. I mean, now that I know the answer is 92, I'd know put it in between 90 and 100, but a little bit closer to 90. But... Until I answered this question, when I first drew the picture, I didn't know this number, so I wouldn't have known where to put it in my picture. Anyways. Um, I'm going to put 270 in the middle, and then I'm not going to count up and down by 30s. I'm not too worried about that because I indicated on my page somewhere what sigma was equal to, so the reader can follow what we're doing. Um, suppose that a football league has special shoulder pads for especially heavy offensive tackles. All right, that's not true at all, but I had to make up an example. They only want to give them to the heaviest 2% of offensive tackles. That's strange too, but fine. Really what this question is getting at is how heavy would an offensive tackle have to be? So they're pretty damn heavy. Only 2% of offensive tackles are heavier than them. The heaviest 2%. There's some cutoff way the hell over here. So that only 2% is above that, is to the right of that point. This shaded region right here is 2%. Now I want to know what is this number right here. Again, I'm not trying to find the area. I'm told the area. It's a little bit tricky to tell that you're told the area. It takes practice. We'll do a lot of examples so you can get some practice on this. I can figure that out. What weight you would have to be to fall into that region by using the inverse norm function on my calculator. There's a little trick this time. So again, inverse norm, it's under distribution, so you get second and then variables, the third thing listed. It wants the area to the left of this point. That's not pictured. The area to the right of this point is pictured, it's 2%. If the area to the right of this point is 2%, then the area to the left of this point must be 98%. 100% minus 2% gives me 98%. So my first argument in the inverse norm function in my calculator would be 98%. I think that's a little bit tricky.
Then I give it center and spread. Those are 270 and 30 respectively. And if I type those in, 0 0.98, 270, and 30, it'll give me this weight. A couple comments. Some of you, if you have a really fancy calculator, you can tell it that 2% is the area to the right of the point that I'm looking for. It gives you more options and you can do that. But on this version, you can't. So I'm going to do it the way you can do it. If you don't have a version that's quite as fancy, you might have to type those in with commas in between them. That's easy enough. Just type it in just like it looks right here. The comma key is right here. Hit enter. It spits out a weight for you. It's 331 pounds. It's a big boy. 331.61 pounds. So what this is saying is that any offensive tackle that weighs more than 331.61 pounds would be in the heaviest 2% of offensive tackles, and therefore they get these special shoulder pads. What I wanted to illustrate with this example is sometimes the area that's given to you in the problem isn't the area below the point in question. Sometimes it's the area above, or something even different as we'll see in the next example. But that's fine. If they give you the area above, figure out the area below. If they give you the area to the right, figure out the area to the left. The area to the right is 2%. The area to the left is 98%. Last example. Between which two weights would I find the middle 60% of offensive linemen? I guess this should say offensive tackles because there's guards and centers too. In terms of their weight. Well, I know that the weight of offensive tackles is approximately normally distributed, so I'm going to draw this picture again. And the center is 270. And the spread is 30, but I'm not going to count up and down by standard deviations, because at this point, I don't know where the middle 60% are. I can picture the middle 60%, all right? Maybe I'll draw, shade in about 60% of this distribution. Maybe it's something like this. That look like about 60% of the total area underneath the curve. There's the middle 60% right there. But I don't know the bounds that will give me that 60%. I don't know this number here and this number here. I got to figure those out. Fortunately, I can use inverse norm to figure those out. I'll have to use inverse norm twice. I'll use inverse norm once over here to figure out this number. And then I'll use inverse norm again over here to figure out this number. For this one, I got to figure out the area to the left of this point, this unknown point right here. How much area is to the left of it? Well, let's see. If 60% is in the middle, then 40% is on the outsides, right? Because 100% somewhere. 100% minus 60% leaves me with 40%. If 40% total is on the outside, then what that means is that 20% is over here and 20% is over here. Right? Maybe now you sort of see the reason, the justification for teaching the empirical rule in the first place. Being able to convert this question that tells you the middle 60% into, oh, that means one of these points has 20% below it. And as we'll see, this point has 80% below it, so that I can use the inverse norm function. That's probably easy for you to do if you were really good at the first way of doing the empirical rule questions. But if you really struggled with the empirical rule, you might struggle with kind of that interpretation of these pictures. You might have a hard time seeing, until you draw it in the picture, that what I'm going to put into the inverse norm function to figure out this point is 0 0.2 and then 270 and then 30. Inverse norm function, again, it's under the distribution menu. It's the third thing listed. The area to the left of this point, one of the two points that I'm trying to figure out for this problem, is 20%. In other words, 0 0.2. Center is 270, and the spread is 30. Hit enter, and it'll spit out 244 and change. 244 points, 0 0.8, I guess, 0 0.75. I've been doing two decimal places, so let's stick with that. That's the left bound of the middle 60%. What about the right bound of the middle 60%? Well, i got to figure out this number right here. To figure out this number, I use the inverse norm function on my calculator. So I'm not trying to figure out an area. I'm trying to figure out a number down on the bottom of the distribution here. If I'm using inverse norm, I need to know how much area is below this point. Well, below this point is this shaded 60% and this unshaded 20%, so a total of 80%. Use inverse norm, 80%, 270 and 30.
and it's going to spit out another weight for me, 295 pounds. 295.25. What this is saying is the middle 60% of offensive linemen in terms of their weight, or offensive tackles in terms of their weight, weigh between 244.75 pounds and 295.25 pounds. The answer to this question, between which two weights? Between this weight right here and this weight right here. What's the absolute minimum that I, you, need to know about inverse norm? Well, know that it's a function in your calculator. It's under the distribution menu, hit second, then variables. And then you always give it three arguments. The area to the left, the center, and the spread, if you have the same software that I have. Note that the inverse norm function will never tell you the area under a curve. Never. The normal CDF always tells you the area under a curve. Inverse norm never tells you that. This is not the area under the curve. This is not the area under the curve. The area under the curve are these 60s and these 20s. These give you values that correspond with given areas under the curve. Use the best way I can say it. Use inverse norm when you're told the area underneath the curve. Uh, in order to understand that you are told the area underneath the curve, you need to know this fact. The area under the curve means one of two things. It means the probability that one offensive lineman weighs between these weights, and it means the proportion of all offensive linemen that weigh in between these two weights. One last thing before I end this video. Maybe I should end it here. This is getting a little bit long. But one last thing that I think can really help students' intuition is, maybe this is a question for you. If I took my calculator and I typed in normal CDF, you're like, well, this is the inverse norm function section, not the normal CDF section, true. 244.75, 295.25, What would my calculator tell me? Approximately what would my calculator tell me? If you can figure that out, you have a very impressive understanding at this point of these different functions. What this is asking is how much area is underneath the curve whose center is 270 and whose spread is 30, so a curve like this, in between 244 and 295. How much area is underneath this curve in between these two bounds? It should give me 60%. If you understand why this should give me 60% or like 59.99999 because these are rounded or something, that's fantastic. If you don't believe me, I'm going to show you real quick and then I'm going to end this video. Normal CDF, lower bound is 244.75. I round it to two decimal places. 295.25 is my upper bound. Center is 270. Spread is 30. And sure enough, it tells me that's 60%. If you can make that connection, understand how you figure out these two numbers, and then understand if you were given these two numbers, how you could have found this area, how you're kind of going back and forth, how the answer to the, this question using normal CDF is this answer. And the answer to this question using inverse norm are these answers. If you can see that connection between the two, you have a really impressive understanding of inverse norm and normal CDF. If not, don't worry, I'm going to make another video on this stuff trying to tie those ideas together.